Erin Nabolsi directed, wrote, and executive produced The Present, which is nominated at the Oscars for Best Live Action Short Film. Uh, now let's start with the title. Uh, how did you come up with that and what does it mean? Well, it started off with just, you know, different different titles, but in the end settled on the present um, with for the double meaning, really. So you have the present in the sense of a gift that Yusuf goes to buy an anniversary gift for his, his wife, but also because it's represented uh, representative of of the present time. Um, it's a fiction film, but it is based on a reality on the ground in Palestine today. So it was indicative of the present time as well, certainly. Now the film opens with your main character, Yusuf, uh, sleeping outside. Uh, can you break down uh, what's happening in that scene? Yeah, so um, I, I've been to Palestine many, many times. I've been at these checkpoints and I also was at a, a particular infamous checkpoint very early in the morning. And I noticed all these, these laborers sleep in cardboard boxes and it, it you know baffled me but the idea is that a lot of these palestinians in order to get to the checkpoints to get to work for example they get there super super early because they're coming from all over the west bank some of them take bus rides that are an hour an hour and a half two hours long just to get to the checkpoint and the checkpoint is where they end up queuing for a number of hours as well so what they do is they try to get there early and they nap on the ground outside and then head into the checkpoint. So, you know, I wanted very much as an audience to understand who Yusuf was, like sort of his backstory in that sense before we got into the main story, just to get an idea of who this man is and what he has to do every single day, uh, just, just to earn a living. So, so that was an opening scene to sort of set the place and the time in that sense, um, and, and really to kind of understand this man's life. And when you were casting him, what qualities were you looking for um, in an actor? Well, interestingly enough, so I co-wrote the script uh, with Hinchafani. Let me turn that off. Okay. Um, I co-wrote the script with Hinchafani. She's a Palestinian filmmaker as well. And she asked me when, when we were kind of, you know, in draft, whatever it was, who do you picture as Yusuf? Now I had seen Saleh Bekri in a number of feature films. He's, he's a very seasoned actor. He's been at some amazing films of, um, and he's the actor that just kept coming into my mind. And the world conspired because she says to me, well, I know him. I was like, what? So she introduced us via email and he read the script. And what I was looking for in my protagonist is exactly what Saleh Bekri projects to me. Um, I needed someone at their core who really understood in his heart, you know, the, the, the character of Yusuf um, and could bring this sort of depth and, and dignity um, and intensity to, to the role, to the character. And Saleh brings that pretty much to all his work and his roles, but, um, but he especially brought it to, to this role, actually. Um, so I didn't need to audition anyone. Uh, you know, for me, it was... Saleh liked the script, he liked the simplicity of the story, and, and then that was it. I, I was thrilled that he would even be willing to be in, in my film as a directorial debut, you know? Um, and, uh, and then that's that for him. So I, I didn't need to even audition, to be really honest. Yeah, you mentioned this being your directorial debut. Uh, how did you learn how to direct? <laughs> by making this film. No. <laughs> so, yeah, so I had wrote and, and produced uh, previous short films that, are, that were adaptations of some personal writings I had. So they're very different, portrait and, and almost tone poem and experimental. But I wanted to direct. I wanted to attempt to direct. But I think I, I was suffering from a bit of imposter syndrome because I didn't go to film school. I didn't work in the industry um, up until just a few years ago. And I thought, well, hold on, don't you have to go to film school? Don't you have to have some you know, formal or informal, but training? But I've realized you, you don't actually. If you can, great. But if you don't or you can't or you don't have the finances to, you can still direct a film. And I think it was Stanley Kubrick who said the best education in film is to make one. I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more. So for me, it was I made the decision 
because I could see very, very clearly in my mind's eye, the whole world of, of the present. I could see even the, 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 the jacket that Yasmin is wearing. I, I, I could see it all in this very vivid visual verbal imagination. And I think that's the key here. If you can see it, you can direct it. And so I threw caution to the wind, but at that point when I knew I was, I was taking the plunge, Okay, yes, I was on Amazon ordering the books. I was, you know, watching the master classes. I was speaking to my direct director friends, um, taking advice. Um, and and then that's it. You 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 just go make it. And and for me, like I said, because I could see it here, I think the rest followed, you know. And I I'm not saying I'm over my imposter syndrome. I've come to the conclusion that most people in the in the in the visual arts or in the arts actually in general are bearing a part of their soul. And there's always gonna be a bit of, of vulnerability and, and a sense of, of, of imposter syndrome, even the most seasoned of actors and directors, I think have it. And uh, certainly it's not like before, but I feel more confident, but I, I, I'm pleased obviously, but, um, but this is how I did it. I mean, it was, you see it, you can make it. Yeah, I think you can uh, get over the imposter syndrome. I mean, you're nominated for an Oscar, so. <laughs> and we just won a BAFTA. Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, tell me about that then. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we just won a BAFTA two days ago, which is, is beautiful because, you know, we're in a world right now that's kind of crying out for an end to, to racism and discrimination. And, and you've got the Black Lives Matter movement that stands in strong solidarity with indigenous peoples, with the Palestinian people. And I think in the film industry, there's been a lot of talk about diversity and you know um, representation. And really the, the subject matter of my film is not something you often see on the big cinema screen to be really frank. And so I'm, I'm so thrilled that, that, that even as a topic, it has resonated, I, I believe. And then of course, I'm, I'm British, uh, but Palestinian, 100% Arab, Muslim, female. Um, and I feel like I've been welcomed, you know, it, it, you know, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker. And so, you know, the BAFTA has all of these diversity standards going on right now where, you know, we're trying to broaden um, representation and things like that. So I'm absolutely thrilled. I mean, the present literally won two days ago and uh, what surprised you about uh, being a director? What surprised me about being a director? I think I didn't give directors enough credit. Do you know that? I think I think before becoming a director, I, it's not to say I didn't admire and 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 say, okay, you know, directors, the creative force, and then there's other work actually directors do, unless you're on some mega film where you know, everything's covered, budgets are done, producers are doing everything, executive, you know, it's very rare. Um, we know in independent cinema, even as a director, you're wearing so many different hats and you're doing so much. Um, but I think prior to directing, I really did not realize just how much a director directs in every element, not just with actors, not just with what you see on the screen, at least for me, I'm very involved, whether it's the editing, the music, the uh, everything and, and beyond. You're, you're dealing with your producers, you're you have to take into consideration budgets, you have, there's so much. And I think I took that a little bit for granted, if I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> did the film always end the way that it ends now or did you kind of play with, um... Yeah, no, played with it. I mean, with with film, with with writing, anyway, you never you what you start off with never ends up, of course, where you 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 end up. Um, I I just had a premise: man goes, gets, can't fit, comes back. This, you know, okay. Then you write the first draft. And, you write, and I remember so again with Hind, uh, I had I had read the sort of again. I think we were on the second draft. It was quite early on. And I said, you know what? No, 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 no. I, I've been at these checkpoints. There are children there. It's not like men and women just go about their business and there are no children. The children are subjected to these checkpoints as well. And they witness the humiliation of their parents and, and the impotence of their fathers, their superhero fathers. And they themselves suffer the humiliations actually, when you think about it, it's, it's you know. So I decided, no, I want him to have his child with him. And I decided it's gonna be a female. Um, uh, that was just a, a choice of mine. And I said, yeah, we want to. And so it was a rewrite, you know, we, 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 we brought her in. Um, looking back, it's ridiculous without her in so many ways, but you, you know, you, you go where the creativity takes you. Um, 
So, so the ending. So honestly, um, I'm sad to say the most fictitious part of our fiction film that's based on reality is that ending. Um, but like I said, I, I wanted to offer something more hopeful and a suggestion. And so how that came about was I, I had various endings. The more realistic ending was my original ending, which unfortunately is lethal force, yeah. physical injury, arrest. Um, and it was actually the actress's father, who was also the production designer on the set. And I was visiting in Nazareth and he said to me, you know, I hadn't finalized the ending. It was still kind of up in the air, like, oh, I don't know, you know. And he said to me, what if his daughter saves him? And I loved it. When, when I heard him say that, I was like, yes, yes. And I'm like, but how? And he's like, I don't know. It's like, okay, let me think about this. And of course your creative juices go. So I had three versions of kind of how this could end where somehow the daughter played that role. And, and, and the one you see is the one I, I kind of settled on and decided I would, I would do. And I'm so glad I did. Um, but yeah, so it, it evolves, it evolves. It evolves. We had some scenes that um, we removed and we had some scenes that we filmed. And then in the edit, there's a couple of scenes where, you know, we just took it out. You wanted to make it tighter. The, the, the electric shop, that was a bit longer. There was a bit more humor. It was very cute, but it was out of genre. It just felt like, oh, we've just gone a bit too much into comedy here. You know, it, it didn't fit. Took it out. Um, I'll let you into a secret. We had uh, the first opening scene before you see him on the cardboard was actually he's in a what you'll discover is a dream. So at first he's in the most beautiful olive field with olive trees and it's just a beautiful day and he's happy and he's just touching nature. And then he wakes up and then we're there and it was beautiful, but did I need it? Was it, was it, did it really add to the film? And, and, and all, all it did was just add length. And, and I guess, you know, in many ways, part of the, the beauty of the film and that people are enjoying is it's only 24 minutes and yet it flies by and it's, it's compact, it's compact. But the first cut was 33 minutes, so. Wow. Uh, I want to ask about a, a small detail. Uh, he goes to uh, the grocery store and then he asks about the pharmacy. They say there's a death in the family and then they're sold out of painkillers. Uh, I'm wondering what, what was that whole exchange about or was it anything? Far more in Gaza, but in the West Bank, it's not necessarily that like everything's available. It's not the most like, it's, it's under a lot of economic strangulation and, and, you know, and a lot of home run businesses as well, family run businesses and things like that. So in the end, you know, he's, he's left his painkillers at home and, and his back is, is straining. He's been in that cage. And, and it's just a natural thing is like, okay, normally pharmacies would be open, whether there's, you know, deaths in families or whatever, but you no, know, in the West Bank, it's, it's a fam family run in so many ways. And so his luck, his luck is out. Um, and, you know, they're not available and the pharmacies closed and he keeps pushing, he keeps going with his day. The idea being that everything that happens to him in this film, in this day, other than the checkpoints could happen to anyone right? Your kid needs the bathroom. Uh, it starts to rain. You have back pain. Um, you need to buy a gift. This is all standard. But the difference are in a different landscape. Your kid needs the bathroom. You run into a restaurant, say, can we use the bathroom? Or, uh, you know, it rains, you hail a cab. You have back pain. There's a gazillion pharmacies or, you know, it's, it's just a different dynamic. So he's having to deal with all of these things and military occupation segregated roads, checkpoints. The whole idea was not to, this is the PG version of what happens at these checkpoints. There are stories of women giving birth at these checkpoints. There are stories of people dying at these checkpoints because they can't get to a hospital because they're held up, right? I, I, I don't think that's as relatable. I don't think that's a story. It's, 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 there are stories that need to be told, but that's not the story I wanted to make. I wanted to make one that was so simple. You wanna go do something, but in this landscape, it's absurd that you can't bring your gift home. It's absurd the obstacles and the hoops that you have to go through just for such a simple task. And I think that's where people can really relate and go, wow, this is crazy. And the other crazy thing is people assume because it's their cognitive dissonance that it's a border. He's not crossing yeah. border. He's not crossing border. In the morning when he's going to work, arguably that could be called a border because he's heading to East Jerusalem. But the main checkpoint on the film is not a border of any kind. 
There's over 100 Israeli checkpoints all over the West Bank. This is not in Israel. This is in the occupied territories, the West Bank, which constitutes West Bank and Gaza. And there's over 100 checkpoints all over between Palestinian villages and towns and cities. And so he's just going from his village to a town, you know? It's crazy. It's, it's actually crazy. So yeah, the landscape is what's absurd. And the landscape is what adds the drama to the story. The story itself, there's no drama. Man goes by his gift and comes back, you know? So. All right, well, a lot to think about. Uh, thanks very much for chatting with Gold Derby today. Thank you. Thanks for having me.